from the top of the globe where northern lights dance. Dog teams pull for glory. From America's farthest north university, the center of Arctic science and the birthplace of Alaska statehood. From the home of the blue and gold, a place where students know how to suit up and make the most of 40 Below. This is Nanook News. Good evening, I'm Spencer Tordoff. And I'm Katie Stark. Coming up in the minutes ahead. New blood wins the Yukon quest. Alaska natives and other supporters show solidarity with Standing Rock. And on a cold night, a data journalist discusses medical records and why you should be worried. All that and more, stay with us. Welcome back. Hi, I'm David Jones. And I'm Arnisha Smith. For Bakesons reported back in late January on their experiences protesting the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline near the Standing Rock Indian Reservation. Native leaders and activists told stories and showed photos from their visits for interested members of the community. The group also discussed the future of the protest movement. Dorothy Shockley said, the movement mirrors the struggles indigenous people have faced for 200 years. We're doing this, we're still doing the same thing, fighting to protect our land, fighting to protect our water, fighting for our indigenous rights as Native people. You know, there were a lot of Alaskans at Standing Rock. Yeah, and there was a protest here on campus as well, Dave. David, you recently covered something interesting the other night. Yes, that's correct. I had the privilege of sitting in on a talk about how your medical data is being used, and it might surprise you just where it's going. These anonymized records with vo uh, voter registration information. And she found that if you match the date of birth, the gender, and the zip code of a person, you can identify 87% of all Americans. Data, invisible, intangible but not necessarily private. People came to the UAF Miri Auditorium on the promise of getting a glimpse of how your medical records are bought and sold without your permission. Now, Journalist Adam Tanner has spent years to looking into how companies I gather and use our seemingly anonymous data. Is His so first even, book, What Stays in Vegas, the industry, there are covered personal know, data you know, that Vegas casinos that scrape for that from test. credit she card purchases. Know. Tonight, he's here talking about his newest book, Our Bodies, Our Data, reporting on how our most private information is shared by companies without your consent, and that even the most embarrassing info about someone can be found if you know where to search. This is a list I found at a, uh, a big data broker convention. This is 1.7 million American men with erectile dysfunction. Again, name, address, phone number, email, so that people can market to them. And so I said to them, can you share with me how you got this information? And they said, well, these men, these men have volunteered this information to us. And so I'm thinking 1.7 million men, I don't believe that even one guy is going to volunteer this information to you. So I said to them, well, uh, look. After the talk, those who were eager to learn more about their medical data lined up for copies of our bodies, our data. Tanner signed them quickly, almost like a doctor's scrawl on your medical chart, soon to be turned into data. Where it's going, though, who knows? For Nanak News, this is David Jones. Wow, I definitely need to pay attention to my medical records from now on. Moving on to events that affects us all. Lawmakers are struggling to put together a budget balancing needs against oil revenue losses. John Doherty has an update.
Hi, I'm John Doherty. In the news from Juneau, the Capitol is continuing work on the state spending plans for the coming year. This is a process that requires hard choices. A third straight year of low oil prices has left Alaska hunting for money to offset the projected billions of dollars in deficits. The latest proposal from the state Senate would cut back funding for K-12 education and the university and transportation. The only revenue measure that Senate leaders have discussed so far would tap into earnings from the Alaska Permanent Fund, the state's constitutionally protected oil savings account. Alaskans collect some of those earnings in the form of annual dividend checks. The Senate plans will lower the checks from about $2,000 each, qualifying resident to perhaps half as much for the second straight year. House lawmakers and the governor support the dividend adjustments along with other proposals for new revenue sources, including what is perhaps the most controversial change suggested, reinstitute a state income tax which lawmakers killed when oil began flowing from the North Slope decades ago. Senate leaders say that's a non-starter. In other news, in Juneau, a spending bill approved by the Senate would bring an end to the Alaska Performance Scholarship. The Senate bill currently under review by the Senate Finance Committee would reallocate funds currently used for the college scholarship to pay for K-12 innovation grants. These grants paid directly to the schools could soften the blow from other cuts. Since it was created in 2012, nearly 15,000 students have qualified for the performance scholarship, with about a third of them using it to attend college within the state. St state Bill 103 would also eliminate the Alaska Education Grant, which provides financial assistance for impoverished Alaskans. Coming up, the 1,000-mile Yukon Quest has a new champion. A wrap-up of UAF's hockey season, and we go on the road with the Nanook Swimmers. All ahead on sports. Hi, I'm Terrence Owens. And I'm Aaron Walling. And uh, let's talk sports here in the frozen north, shall we? Find out who won the Yukon Quest. Nanooks have frustrating season, but was it a success? And we'll also dive into the world of college swimming. The Yukon Quest was won by a new face this year, but one who has mushing in his blood. Reporter Spencer Tordoff has more. Just after noon on Valentine's Day, mushing fans in downtown Fairbanks got to meet their new sweetheart, 25-year-old Two Rivers musher Matt Hall. Hall was hours ahead of his nearest rival when he crossed the finish line here in Fairbanks. Hall won the 2017 Yukon Quest with a time of 10 days, 1 hour, and 7 minutes. He previously finished the race in third place back in 2014. The first-time champion is carrying on the family tradition. His dad, Wayne, finished the Yukon Quest three times, most recently in 2009. Hall is the only second-generation musher to win the race and both father and son received the Challenge of the North Award on their rookie outing as well. The award recognizes mushers who exemplify the persevering spirit of the Yukon Quest. Hall told the crowd that he was wowed by all the support he received from fans along the trail. I was just amazing um, coming in. I mean, this whole this whole last run in here, you know, uh, start, starting back uh, going, through, going through two rivers, um, you know, it's the middle of the night. I think I went through there at six this morning or something. And, uh, you know, there was uh, three different groups of people out there. You see their little headlamps flickering down the trail coming out to cheer me on. Um, and uh, that was that was pretty special. And then, uh, then we rounded a corner and started to leave two rivers. And, uh, and then there's these signs just as far as you can see on each side of the trail for every musher in the race. And uh, just the, the support that the community gives there. Um, which just for me was pretty, pretty beautiful, I guess. And then, uh, then the closer we got into town here, just you know, like, yeah, just the the excitement, um, you know, the, the crowd here, everybody, uh, everybody out here. Um, it's uh, yeah, it was pretty special. For Nanook News, I'm Spencer Tordoff. This spring, collegiate swimmers from all along the West Coast met in LA for regional conference championships. 
They were competing for the spots in the national championship. Our own Katie Stark, a competitive swimmer in her own right, was on the road with Nanook Swimmers. Here's her report. This is Katie Stark with Nanook News, and I'm here at the East Los Angeles College Aquatic Center, where the 2017 College Swimming Championships is currently underway. Twelve colleges compete in the championship meet that takes place February of each year at the East Los Angeles College Aquatic Center. Prelims begin every morning at 9.30 and conclude with the final heats of each event at around 7 o'clock every night. UAF sophomore Sierra Kinworthy just missed her school record in the 1,000 freestyle. Good. I dropped a second and missed the varsity record by a second, so that was a bummer, but I'm really glad I dropped. Um, Kinsey did a really good job of creating my taper, so I feel really great and I'm really looking forward to the rest of this weekend. So far, the meet is going well for the UAF swim team. Despite having only six people at the meet, the team has shown a distinct presence. Nanook Swimming head coach Scott Lemley is excited about the success of his top distance swimmer. Uh, the 1,000 freestyle, uh, our sophomore, Cassidy Heaton, broke the varsity record by 14 seconds, did a lifetime best by 15 seconds, and probably swam fast enough to be selected for the national championships. At the end of the meet, seniors from all the teams gather to be recognized for their dedication to the sport. The stands are crowded as parents line up along the railing to film their swimmer or throw flowers. Senior recognition is an opportunity for us to thank girls who have given to the program for four years. And we usually uh, state their hometown, their major, and anything they accomplished while they were on the team. Well, Terrence, the Nano hockey season is over here at UAF, and was it successful, though? Uh, I thought it was a pretty successful season for them. Uh, I feel like making the playoffs or, you know, doing something like that is always successful. But we did have that important game, the Governor's Cup against right. uh, University of Alaska Anchorage. Right. I know we won it, but what was your thoughts on it? Um, as always, you know, it's, a, it's our rival, so it's going to be a competitive game. So I feel like, you know, when our rivals get together, it's always going to be an exciting game. But I have another question for you, and that is, uh, what is a seawall? Do, do you know? Do you have any? You know what? That stumps the chump. I don't know All what right. that well, is. Then, that, let's just get yeah, well, let's, yeah, let's get right into it. This was an up and down season for the University of Alaska Fairbanks hockey team. The Alaska Nanooks went 12-20-4 this season, which snuck them into the playoffs. There they suffered back-to-back -back losses to Minnesota State University, it was a frustrating season for the Nanooks. However, they did find success against the team down south. Anchorage and the Nanooks met for the up for the Governor's Cup, with the Nanooks dominating the Seawolves this season. In their last matchup, the Nanooks won 2-1 over their better rivals behind Taylor Munson's overtime goal. Overall, the Nanooks won the Governor's Cup 4-1 in the series over the Seawolves. This year, the Nanooks had three players tied for the most goals on the season with Chad Steely, Marcus Pissarro, and Troy Van Teetering scoring eight goals. Well, that's it from us. Thanks for watching Let's Talk Sports here on Nanook News.